Access to Democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center and medispa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. With service built around courtesy, dignity, and respect, Mayo-trained Dr. Charles Crutchfield personally treats each patient and is acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. True Stone Financial, with locations in Minnesota and Wisconsin, has proudly served as members since 1939. True Stone engages, educates, and supports its members to ensure they have the tools to empower their financial well-being. True Stone Financial, your neighborhood credit union. Learn more at truestone.org. Edina Eye Physicians and Surgeons, a division of Twin Cities Eye Consultants, has proudly served the Twin Cities for more than 55 years now in seven convenient locations. Using the most advanced technology combined with human touch, Edina Eye offers comprehensive services and dedicated specialists committed to excellence with innovative procedures and expertise for the most advanced eye care. Hello and welcome to this edition of Access to Democracy. I'm Steve Francisco, your host today. It's a real pleasure to welcome back a returning visitor, our good friend, State Representative Sandy Mason. Hello, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming on, Sandy. Sandy represents the 51A Legislative District, which mm -hmm. covers the city of Egan here, or part they of the city of Egan. Right, mostly Egan west of 35E and then all of northern Burnsville is 51A. Right. Um, the, uh, let's uh, tell us about yourself for people who don't know you as well as I and some of our friends do. Uh, where are you from, Sandy? Where okay. did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Okay. I a actually grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. My grandfather, who had uh, moved here from Czechoslovakia, worked in the steel mills, so we were like about 10 minutes away from uh, Republic Steel. Oh. And again, we'll talk about me being on the Transportation Committee, but it was, it was interesting. We had somebody uh, pr make a presentation recently, and she had the map of Broadway, et cetera. I mean, yeah, right where I lived. It. You and knew the neighborhood. I knew, knew the neighborhood. I mean, it's, you know, my grandfather, did well n nobody I mean only my father in our household had a car everybody else just yeah. used the bus yeah. for pu public transportation which is again why I am on transportation and I've always been on transportation as long as I've been in the legislature it's a really important right um, you were educated in public schools in Cleveland yes I was and I then was. went on to college yes I uh, grew, yeah actually the, the uh, public school is just down the street from me and uh, it was the same school my parents went to. And then I started at the junior high, and then that's when we moved to Maple Heights. And mm -hmm. I graduated from Maple Heights High, which is uh, maybe 20 minutes away from downtown Cleveland. And I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to Valparaiso University. Which is in Indiana. It is in Indiana. Yeah, it's, it's very close to Chicago. The same name of the town, right? Valparaiso, exactly. Valparaiso, Indiana. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I am serving on higher ed right now. So I mean that when we're talking about students having a tough time making it through all the way through college, I said, you know, I can relate to that. I mean, I had a scholarship, I had a grant, I had a work study program, and as for as long as I worked, I always went into the bank because I knew I wanted. So you have personal experience seeing how some of these state government programs affect real people, affect right. their it, lives, because it affected your life. Uh, how, how long have you been in the legislature, Sandy? When did you this, get elected? This is my seventh term. I mean, I didn't, uh, the terms are non-consecutive, but totally mm -hmm. it is my, my seventh term. Right. What would you say is the biggest change you've seen in state government since you were first elected to the legislature? I would say probably the working relationship that we have as a group. I mean, definitely, I think it's pretty clear that we're getting to be more partisan 
more then polarized. Have, yeah, exactly. And that's that to me I find really difficult. Sort and of a mirror image of what we've seen happen at the federal level too. I, as you know, I used to be a congressional staffer right. and back in the 80s and 90s when I was in Washington, we didn't agree all the time with our counterparts on the other side of the aisle as they say, but we were able to work together to try to get things done for our constituents. And so the same kind of polarization we see at the national level is seeping down into St. Paul and the state capitol, you and think? I'm, in my opinion, I believe so. And I, I would say the thing that I find difficult, because if I talk to my colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, especially the ones that are on the other side of the aisle, we may still have the same issues. Right. But what I've said time and again, because that uh, group seems to be more organized according to uh, leadership positions, and so you won't won't hear them say their particular issue, mm -hmm. you know, how it impacts their district so much. It's more about doing what the policy is mm. of the party or the party leaders, mm. and that I find uh, difficult to believe. And obviously, I'm a Democrat, and it's we, uh, we have such a broad tent that, I mean, normally we have to, we have to acknowledge each other's differences. Right. And, and, and still be able to work together. Exactly. Let's jump right into it. One of the biggest stories in the news lately is that um, there is a projected budget surplus in the state of Minnesota in just back in November, just a few months ago, they were projecting a $7.7 .7 billion surplus in the current biennium. But there was a just, just an announcement just a few days ago that that budget Monday. surplus has ballooned now to an estimated $9.2 billion in the current biennium. If I'm correct, that is the largest projected budget surplus ever in the history of the state of Minnesota. Uh, Republicans are calling for massive permanent tax cuts. Seems that Governor Waltz and most Democrats are calling for smaller targeted tax cuts aimed at middle class working families and also doing some things on child care perhaps and infrastructure. Um, what are your thoughts about this budget surplus uh, as we go forward? How should this be resolved? Okay, I will tell you first of all that I am getting an incredible number of emails and communications where people want to give it back. And, and for people that I'm able to talk with, I said, do you realize that in 2003, 2004, when Governor Pawlenty was in office, I mean, literally that whole beginning of the decade, they were dealing with uh, just trying to get a balanced budget. And what they did is they took money out of various accounts. So like right now, I believe we should be spending a lot more on education. I mean, we, our students need to be able to participate in the global economy. Uh, and that means we need to uh, educate them appropriately. Well, you have school districts that still have money. Yeah, I mean, the state took money out of school districts. That hasn't been repaid yet. So I said, is that right? That oh, yeah. was back in 2012, and it was, here we it was, are 10 years later, and they still haven't repaid that money. No, and you, know, wow. you can ask your local school district because they bring this up. Yeah, frequently. And a number of these school districts, you raise a good point because they go to the voters then and look for an increase, special levies to provide adequate funding from the voters. Uh, rather than relying on the legislature necessarily to appropriate enough money for them. And over the years, while I've been in the legislature, it's usually been a tough fight getting them the final budget that we have for, and uh, what we're talking, mm -hmm. you know, uh, basically the, the K through 12 system. And last year is probably where I think we gave the largest percentage on the per pupil funding since I have been in the legislature. Wow. Hmm. And th again, that was after a big fight, but at least we did that. So that was a good thing. It, that was huge. I yeah. mean, to me, that was that was huge, but does it make up for all the holes that have t been taken place over the, over the well, yeah. as I said, it's been quite a f number of years. And I will go back to 
1998 when both the uh, governor Ventura and the Republicans, that's what they came campaigned on. There was a surplus back then. They campaigned. We all remember the Jesse checks, checks, as they were called, and now we're hearing about Walt's checks. Exactly. Proposed. Yeah. And again, okay, so they gave the money back, and then once you got to 2000, they, the state was constantly trying to ma make up their budget. And by law, we have to have a balanced budget. Right. And every biennium, every two years. Two years, right. exactly. And so that is one of the comments that I make is they went, we went literally for 10 years, you know, where they were mm -hmm. taking money out for things because one of the other budgets that they took out or accounts was for the landfill. Mm -hmm. Now, in Burnsville, we have two landfills. Mm -hmm. And the money for the landfills isn't for immediate use. I mean, it's for down the roads. The deal is people that are putting money or putting, uh, I guess, their trash <laughs> into the landfills. I mean, they are providing money should anything happen to that property and right. to the uh, landfill in the future. So that's really important. So that money needs to be mm -hmm. replaced. And I can give you a... So you're, you're saying basically that there are any number of things where we if you will, inelegantly, rob Peter to pay Paul and we haven't repaid Peter. Right. That's basically what you're saying here in a number of these accounts. And something else about this figure, when someone says to the average voter, there's a nine point billion dollar surplus projected, my understanding is this most recent estimate from the, what's the state agency called, Management and Budget? Which it's well the MMB, yep. The MMB. Right. That that estimate does not account for the fact that there is now the Russian war in Ukraine, there are US trade sanctions being applied, doesn't account for the future course of the pandemic. I mean, as you and I sit here today, we are at a moment, thank goodness, where COVID seems to be receding. But we don't know what could happen in the future with new variants that could emerge and what the impact would be on employment and state revenues and everything, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it sounds really great, and it is great. We'd all rather hear about a $9.2 billion surplus rather than a deficit. But we need to be somewhat careful about that too, don't we? Very careful. And in the uh, report on Monday, it w they made it very clear that the figures came before the start of the current war that's going right. on. So that is really important to be aware of and th well, as things may change and it seems to be getting progressively worse. I mean, Unfortunately, the fact that, yeah. Well, so that's huge. Um, go ahead. I was going to ask you, so what types, it seems like a lot of uh, DFLers, Democrats, are open to the idea of some tax relief. Are you open to the idea and should it be targeted and temporary or permanent and more broad? I mean, we're talking about a specific amount of money periods. No, so there's no way we can, should be applying it, in my opinion, mm -hmm. to something that's ongoing. I mean, we can do something right now. And I think, you know, like right now, uh, recently we did pass the bill for the um, emergency or first responder workers. Yes that covered a lot and that was uh, I mean that was significant and I think morally we owed it to the people that were going you know taking care of our sick. You were a sponsor of this legislation <laughs> too which was aimed at as you say first responders or frontline workers Fr exactly. who were helping it's keep Minnesota's economy running at the height of the pandemic. Say a little bit more about that. How much money uh, would this provide to those people? It is, it's, uh, it is adjustment, but basically I think the top somebody could make would be $1,500. Mm -hmm. But it is, to me, we have a moral responsibility. We were asking the people to put their lives on the line and also their families. Because we're they, talking about police? Firefighters, teachers, healthcare workers, people others? work, you know, long-term care workers, people working uh, in, uh, you know, various retails, trans transit. I mean, so we were trying to cover a whole number, and I know at 
one of the last times we were discussing the bill, somebody asked for some doctors, because there are doctors that are working in very, in clinics where they're, they are not making the standard amounts that right. we, you know, compensation that you'd get working in a regular hospital, et mm -hmm. cetera. So we tried to include, I think we, we added that as well at the end. And has this legislation, it's shaping up to pass? It is going it, to pass? It, we just passed it in the House the other day. So it's headed to the Senate? One, yes, and there may be problems with the Senate. They're not Controlled quite. by the Republicans, House is Democratic controlled. Exactly. And Governor Waltz has said if this bill reaches his desk, he plans to sign this. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Very good. Um, as long as we're talking about the governor, let me ask you about that in relation to COVID. There was a very large amount of criticism from Republican legislators over Governor Waltz's role and his handling of the pandemic. And we're talking here specifically about Republican criticism of the governor using emergency powers to respond to the pandemic. And there were repeated efforts by Republicans that were unsuccessful in the House to curtail or take away those powers from Governor Waltz in responding to the pandemic. Share with us, what are your thoughts about those efforts? Was it right for the governor to fight for those emergency powers and to use them, and why? Okay, I'll give you a couple of reasons. Item one, we are a part-time legislature. Maybe not so much as we work, but when we meet, it's, right. you know, there is a big gap there. And in order also to get some of the uh, federal help, it was important for the governor to have those powers. And I believe, at least in my district, the people that I was talking to, they, they, th they really, really believe that the governor did the best job he could to keep our population safe. And uh, the Republicans, again, I'm, I'm getting very personal here. The comments that they made, the leadership that they did not show through most of the pandemic, I just found appalling. And this was, when we talk about emergency powers, we're talking about uh, curtailing school calendars, perhaps, or in-person learning temporarily or talking about mask requirements in public spaces and among state employees and state agencies, right. right? And exactly, and you know, at the start of COVID, we didn't have the vaccinations uh, taking place either. So it was, I mean, I believe he was trying to get the best resources and expertise avail uh, information available and I mean, you know, just, Living and, in Minnesota, we're very lucky. And the Republicans went so far as when they didn't get their way, they were threatening to terminate Health Commissioner Jam Malcolm right. from her position, doing this very difficult job of trying to save the lives of Minnesotans. Isn't it a fact that Minnesota had a lower death rate in this pandemic than some of our neighboring states? And now proportionately or per capita, South Dakota is a much smaller state than Minnesota. I think you could fit the whole population of South Dakota into the South Metro. But the fact is, per capita, they had a much higher death rate than Minnesota did. So did North Dakota and so did Wisconsin. So isn't there some merit to the idea that because the governor took a really aggressive approach to trying to protect public health and safety, he did the right thing? I believe he did, and in talking with, I guess, so many people, they believe that the governor, Governor Waltz, did the best job he could of protecting And not us. perfect. Nobody's perfect. I'm sure he'd admit that, too. But you adjust to information and circumstances as you learn about it, right? And he was very public about that. Right. I mean, things change. And, and they hold and that now, against him, too. I mean, right. he, now you and I are able to visit today without wearing the mask because right. here we record our show at Thomson Reuters. They've gotten rid of the requirement. There isn't a requirement in Egan or Dakota County to wear the masks, fully vaccinated, received our booster shots and all that. And let's hope that COVID is receding into the rearview mirror, but you never know. So we may end up seeing this issue come back. I wanna ask you about another issue that is the biggest story perhaps in the news today, Minnesotans are, and the free world, are absolutely appalled 
by what they see the Russian government and Vladimir Putin doing to the Ukraine. An unprovoked, uh, violent invasion of a neighboring country, the Ukraine, a sovereign state. Governor Tim Waltz recently asked the State Board of Investment to review the state's holdings in Russia-linked companies. Do you support this review? And would you favor the state of Minnesota disinvesting in companies linked to Russia? Boy, that's a big question. And uh, typically, because the investments in, impact pensions, I'm usually very, very conservative in, in what we do. But right now, I can tell you, I mean, people are very, very upset about what's taking place. And actually, we have a... Uh, fairly good size representation of people from the Ukraine yes. in our area. And, and coincidentally, a significant Russian population. Exactly. Even right here in Egan and in St. Paul, parts e of St. Paul. Exactly. Yeah. So th again, that's important. And I know I was a woman had called me the other day, and I mean, she was really upset about what was happening in there. And she, you know, her comment is she wants us meaning the, the country, to do everything to the right. nth degree. And at the federal help. level, to be sure, President Biden has announced a range of sanctions that the U.S. has coordinated with our NATO allies to be applied right now to the Russian government and Mr. Putin. Seems that those are having an impact from all of the reports that we're seeing. So this just raises a question whether or not we should look at that at the state level. But you raise a good point about we have a fiduciary responsibility to the pension funds to make sure that we don't make bad decisions, but perhaps some of those investments in Russian companies may not be a good bet long-term too, so and we shall see. But I've noticed uh, there have been some li liquor stores in our area that have announced they are no longer carrying Russian-made vodka and other alcoholic beverages uh, and are uh, looking at other Russian projects, products that they can uh, stop selling because they don't want to put money into the hands of Russian oligarchs. And I, and I understand that. I mean, we're watching these atrocities on Terrible. television. I mean, it's, it's so hard. And I, I keep wondering, how do these soldiers, the Russian soldiers, go into a country where these people they're peaceful people. Well, many of them, we're finding out now, captured Russian soldiers. We're talking about troops who are 18, 19, 20 years old that were lied to by their own military commanders, told they were going on training missions, and suddenly find themselves crossing the border into Ukraine. And many of them have surrendered to Ukrainian forces or some of the news accounts that I'm hearing, too. But it's just an awful situation. and. Minnesotans' hearts go out. I would imagine, too, at some point when the U.S. takes in uh, Ukrainian refugees that some of those refugees most likely will end up coming to our state as refugees yeah. always have. Exactly. From Southeast Asia, from Latin America, from Russia, from places where they politically were politically or religiously persecuted. And that, you know, I would agree with you. I mean, we have people from all of those places and uh, it's the outpouring of support for the U Ukrainian uh, people right now is huge. Yeah. It's, it's huge. I mean, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite yeah. as extensive. So I think we have, a, we have, to give, have a lot of latitude there. We have to give Vladimir Putin credit. He's done something I never thought I would see, which is he has pulled together, to some extent, people from the political left and political right who are horrified by what he is doing in the Ukraine. I mean, yeah. How do you justify destroying schools? Right. In, and going in, after hospitals that are treating children dealing with cancer. I mean, I just, it's all I can do to barely even watch CNN these days and see it's, this. It's so upsetting. I saw that last and night. And I think all of my fellow Minnesotans, and I'm sure you too, right. we all have the same reaction. Sandy, let me ask you real quick, we're down to about three and a half minutes here. I want to ask you about police reform and the surge in crime that we're seeing in our state right now. And um, we all know the horrific events, the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis by Derek Chauvin. He was convicted, sentenced to 22 years. 
We've recently had the other police officers who were involved in that incident convicted of violating Mr. Floyd's civil rights. There have been calls for the legislature to enact police reform. Are there some police reforms that you see that you could support and that you think we should be doing? Okay. Well, I know that uh, Carlos Mariani, mm -hmm. uh, the representative of St. Paul, it chairs the he chairs public safety committee, and actually, I just was listening to him on the radio mm. today when he was being interviewed about the what the bill that he has put together. So I can tell you that, and I've known Carlos for a long, long time. I think he's doing an incredible job of trying to come up with a job with a bill that will solve some of the problems, and then also something a bill that we can get to the governor's desk, which is the, um, the most important thing. I mean, we need to be able to get through the House, through the Senate. And the big question is, will you get bipartisan support in the Senate to get a bill out where yeah. they may have very different views? Let's talk, too, real quickly, because time is running low. We're also seeing, at the same time, there are issues about police reform. Uh, we're seeing a surge in criminal activity, unfortunately, in the metro area, and some of that has extended right here to Egan and suburban communities. What are your thoughts about that? What can, are the laws that we have for dealing with carjacking, smash and grab thefts, these types of things, do you believe they're adequate, or do, do we need to look at other laws or additions to the statutes? I mean, we obviously need to do something to address the problem. Uh, legislative, may, maybe there may be options, but we're talking a bigger problem than just uh, what's, what we're seeing with some of our young people. And that, to me, is problematic. I am on transport, as I said, on transportation. Yeah. We're seeing, you know, I was visiting a uh, construction zone around Maple Grove in the construction zone, and the and speed limit is 60 miles an hour, an hour, which to me is fairly good for a construction yeah. zone. And people are being clocked at 100 miles per hour Ridiculous. or more. I mean, people's behaviors, for some reason, people are no longer feel a responsibility to their community. To other people. And they just feel that whatever they want to do is okay. And and that is something, as a community, we need to be addressing because every address. family seems to have one, <laughs> one yeah. person. Yeah. Um, Sandy, we're down to our last 30 seconds. There's much more you and I could talk <laughs> okay. about, but uh, congratulations on serving your seventh term in the Minnesota House. Thank you for your work on behalf of the people of Egan and Dakota County in the state of Minnesota. And uh, it's a real pleasure to see you again on our show. Come back and see us again. I would love to. Thank you so very, very Thank much. Thank you. State Representative Sandy Mason of Egan.